I've got GCSEs in two weeks, remember? So what do you want books for? Dad said we might not be able to get Wi-Fi. What? A whole week with no internet? Ha! I've got signal. Uh, now remember, you two, you can text and call your parents, but no one else. This place is only a safe house because no one, other than them, and a few individuals in Gloucestershire Force, know you're here. Are there other houses in this? What's it called? Witness Protection Programme, Ed. Yeah, they're dotted about all over the place. And um, what about the neighbours? Do they know? The nearest neighbours are a farmhouse half a mile away. Most people think this is a holiday let. It's very secure. So, that horrid man following me? Can't follow you anymore. Can't you just arrest him? We'd have to catch him first. Is he a member of this gang who are going on trial? We're not sure. I certainly hope not. Why? Because they're a very nasty bunch and we don't want them intimidating our witnesses. Are there other witnesses? There are, but you're the key witness, Sam. What you heard and what you saw could put these crooks behind bars for a very long time. It makes you feel a bit nervous. Don't worry. I'll look after you. Is that a threat or a promise? <laughs> and, of course, you'll have Mrs Drummond to keep house. She was a uniformed officer before she retired, so she's the right person to have around. We are allowed to go out, aren't we? We won't be stuck in this house all the time. Only if you're accompanied by Mrs Drummond. She should be here shortly. Why don't you two go upstairs and find your rooms and get them packed? Only if you could please carry my case for me. <laughs> this is going to dislocate my shoulder. Look at that huge spider. I bet there's rats here too. Time for a change, but it's still quite a hike from Gloucestershire. Oh, I expect so. But the scenery makes it all worthwhile. I don't know how you stand it up here. What do you do this yourself in the evenings? Oh, I'm not one for nightclubs, Mr. Inspector. <laughs> now, brother and sister, Samantha and Ed. Is uh, they prefer Sam and Ed. I'm so hungry. This sounds like that now. No, you're just greedy. Right, you two. This is Mrs. Drummond, who's going to look after your every need whilst you're here. Welcome to Cormac's Ruin, Sam and Ed. Cormac's Ruin? Is that what this place is called? And there's a story behind that, but I'll tell you all about it once you've settled in. I'd better be on my way. You're reporting daily as usual, Annie. Good. Have fun, everyone. Now, did I hear someone say they were hungry? Starving. Burger, chips and beans? Awesome. Please. Right, I'll make a start. You settle in. TV's not brilliant, but it just about works. <laughs> She 
she's right about the TV. Mrs. Drummond's nice, isn't she? Hey, catch this. They're talking about the trial. And just a week to go before the notorious drugs baron Enrico Forgioni goes on trial, accused of triple murder, attempted murder, and importing more than five hundred million pounds worth of cocaine in one of the largest ever drug seizures in the UK. There is concern that while Forgioni and most of the gang members are in custody, one of them remains at large. And the other main news story... I know you're thinking, Sam. But don't worry. You're safe here. That could be the man they haven't arrested. The one that was following me. That's why you're here, Sam. In the safe house. Suppose... Suppose he's followed us up here. He can't have. He's not going to follow the police. The police are supposed to follow the criminals. Suppose. Food's up, people! Brilliant. I could murder a burger. Come on, Sam. <laughs>
open? No, it was just served, Sam. There were seals after all. Right. I'll make a start on lunch. You know, I'm not sure I'd like a paper round in this place. It must take like half an hour to cycle from one house to the next. <clears throat> hey Ed. Yeah? You know when we're on the beach? Yeah. Did you see that man watching us? What man? The man on top of the cliff. He was looking down at us. I didn't see anyone on the cliff. All I saw was those two surfers. He was about the same height and build as the man who was following me. He was probably just walking his dog. He didn't have a dog. Not one that you could see. But I bet just about everyone around here has a dog. Suppose... Suppose he wasn't from this place. Sam, it couldn't have been the stalker. He has no way of knowing where you are. It's freaking me out, Ed. I can't get him out of my head. Then we must tell Mrs. Drummond. She'd want to know. But what if she doesn't believe me? Of course she'll believe you. Mrs. Drummond's not like that. I'll tell her at lunch then. I wouldn't bother with that. It's really boring. It's about the trial again, isn't it? A leaked report ahead of the trial of Drugs Baron Enrico Forgioni has alleged that a witness has withdrawn the evidence. The witness, who cannot be named for legal reasons, <coughs> is thought to have received threats on his life. Threats on his life! That's why you're here, Sam. So stuff like that can't happen to you. I've had this, Ed. Why should I have to do this? You don't have to do this, Sam. But remember what Mum said. If you don't put these men away, you're always going to be scared. Why did I have to see it? Come on, we're going to tell Mrs Drummond about this man right now. <laughs> I saw this man on the pavement. 
he's running towards me, and at first I thought he was after me, then I realised he's running from the car. You saw the driver? He, it went up on the pavement, and that's when I saw him. Mm -hmm. What did you do next? The man was lying very still. I got my phone around 999. I asked for the police and the ambulance. i just finished the call when the car came back. That must have been terrifying, my dear. Well, I thought, I can't get out of here because I have to wait for the police and the ambulance. That's when he wound down his window. He said something to you. He said, you never saw this, did you? He threatened you. I was dreading he was going to pull a gun out on me or something. That's when I heard the police siren and he drove off. And it was then that the police arrived. And the ambulance. They said the man wasn't dead. Then he could still have been charged with attempted murder. You're extremely brave, my dear. Never been so terrified. But that's what bravery is all about. Going through with something when you're terrified. That's what Ed says. It's so good having him here with me. And it was after that someone started following you. The next day, on my way to school, when I got to the bus stop, there was a man at the bus stop across the road. He was staring at me. And when his bus arrived, he didn't go on. He just kept staring. What did he look like? D.I. Jones asked me that. But it's so difficult because he looks so, so ordinary. Mm. If someone showed you a photograph, <coughs> do you think you'd recognise him again? Oh, uh, yes, I'd recognise him. And you saw him again? Coming home from school. I made sure I was with a group of friends, but he followed us all the way. Did he get on your bus? I don't know, but he did get off at my bus stop, thank goodness. And it was then that your father contacted D.I. Jones to make all these arrangements. Tell me, Sam, did the man on the cliff top look anything like the man who followed you to the bus station? Well, I couldn't see his face. He was too far away, but he was definitely the same kind of build as the man who followed me. Right. The boys at the station need to know about this. I'm just going to make a last cuppa. Would you like one? No thanks, Mrs. Drummond. I'm just going to text my mum and I'll be up to bed. Okay. And don't you worry about the thunder. It'll soon pass. <laughs> You know who it is. What do you want? You know what we want. to withdraw their evidence. You know that, Annie. It's unheard of on my watch, Inspector. I'm not sure I like the tone of your voice, Annie. I'd be careful what I say if I were you. It's my job to be careful. Someone, somewhere, has been careless. Why don't you bring her down? Let me give her a new phone. It's got a few quirks, and you know you're a bit of a technophobe. The poor girl cried all night. Finally, she's asleep. There's no way I'm disturbing her now. Where's the boy? In his room. Naturally, he's pretty shaken that this should happen to his sister. This won't happen again. There's 
Something else you should know. What's that? While we were walking on the beach, Sam says she saw someone looking down at her from the cliff top. Same height and build as the stalker. Annie, you know and I know that with her state of mind, she's going to see stalkers everywhere. But the whole reason we have this place as a safe house is that it's so remote. I hardly ever see anyone on the cliff top. Surfers in the sea, maybe. But not walkers on the cliff top. It's not possible that anyone could know she's here. I better be getting back. In the light of what's happened, Inspector, I'm not so sure. Not so sure of what? That no one knows she's here. Don't you start imagining <coughs> things, Annie. I have no imagination, <laughs> Inspector. <laughs> but I do have a very logical <coughs> mind. Now, I'd better go and check on Sam. Luca? Cool. After last night, it's working just like I said it would. There's no way she's going to make that courtroom now. You want to take it further? Well, my friend, that is up to you. I've done my bit, so now you owe me the balance of our little deal. Just make sure the money's there tomorrow night. All right? Ciao. courtroom next week. You are joking. I'm not going anywhere near any courtroom. Sam, then they'll have won. And you'll be looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life. Is that really what you want? This is like living a nightmare, Ed. Please, let me wake up. You're being incredibly brave, Sam. I know you've got what it takes to see this through. I don't think so. I do. You could have run away when you saw the hit and run, but you didn't. You dialed 999 and waited for the ambulance and the police. Even though that scum came back, you might have even saved the guy's life. I've never been so terrified. That's what bravery is, Sam. Sticking it out, even though you're scared to death. I suppose. And after last night, I want to see that gang in prison more than ever. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And you're the one that can put them there. The only one who can. No but, wonder they're trying to keep you away from this trial. But what I want to know, Ed, is how they know I'm here. I'd like to know that too, Sam. <laughs> Just a myth, Sam. But that's the thing about myths and legends, isn't it? 
You see, kelpies appear whenever there's been an injustice. And last night, a serious injustice was done to you. So, it could be that some powerful forces are on your side, couldn't it? That's an amazing thought. It makes me feel way better. You've been extremely brave, my dear. Not long to go now before they fly you to London. They're going to fly me? What in? Please, helicopter. The full works. Will they come? Of course Ed will come with you. Yeah, of course I'll be with you. I'm a tower of strength. <laughs> you are funny. Then I'm a tower of strength with a sense of humour. <laughs> How are they going to fit a tower of strength into a helicopter? <laughs>
put those in the bathroom for you, Mrs. Drummond. Oh, thanks, Ed. How come you knew surfing was just what we needed, Mrs. Drummond? Ed and I were only talking about it last night. But you've had a difficult time, my dear. And we find that giving our guests plenty of fresh air and exercise can really help. Oh, that surf was mental. Ed and I want a holiday up here when all this is over. Right, I've got a cottage pie that just needs ten minutes in the oven. You know, this place is beginning to feel more and more like a holiday. Fancy Mrs. D digging out the surfboards from the garden shed. They must rent out as a holiday let, when they're not sheltering key witnesses, of course. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. It's supposed to be secret, isn't it? But D.I. Jones said it, that people think this place is a holiday let. So maybe that's its cover. So people around here actually think we're on a holiday? By the way, when we were surfing, did you see the man on the cliff again? Yeah, I did. So did I. He was closer than last time. Could you make out his face? No, but he's the same kind of build as the man who followed me. You'd better tell Mrs Drummond. Try not to let this get to you, Sam. You know what, Ed? I'm starting to get a little annoyed with this pervy who keeps trying to freak me out. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Give up. Why don't you Google it on your new phone? Still feels weird not using my old phone. Alright, leave it to me then. It's Lima. So rubbish at geography. <laughs> well, I'm not much better. You have to really like a subject to be good at it. I wonder what you have to be good at to be a detective. Probably stuff they don't teach you at school. Good memory for faces. Sixth sense. How about common sense? I think Mrs. Drummond has common sense in shed loads. She believes in Kelpies, though. <laughs> <laughs> she talks about sightings of Kelpies, Ed. That's different. I'll get it. I'm not expecting anyone, though. Wonder who that could be. Yes? I'm sorry to bother you, but my car's broken down and my mobile battery's flat. Could I possibly use your landline? I'd be willing to pay. Are you a tourist around here? No, no. I've been looking at a property I'm interested in. I work for a finance company. Here's my car. Very well, Mr. Barlow, but you'll need to be quick. We're going out ourselves shortly. Very, very good of you. The land lies this way, in the kitchen. That's the first person who's called ever since we got here. Well, apart from the food deliveries from Morrison's. And the postman, <laughs> but I mean people we're not expecting. I wonder where his car broke down. Couldn't you just plug this mobile into that to get it working? That's what Dad does. Maybe the car's battery was flat. That's why you broke down? Thank you. I'm very, very grateful to you. That's fine. But we really do need to be going out ourselves now. Just one thing before I go. I've seen you before, young lady. Haven't I? I really must ask you to leave, Mr Barlow. And you've seen me before. Haven't you? Now? Maybe we'll see meet again. Very soon. That was him, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you.
alerted the local forces, they set up a full-scale search. I'm so sorry, Sam, that I let this happen. Don't be sorry, Mrs Drummond. I'm not sorry, especially now I see what a pathetic idiot he is. Good girl. You do know this was their latest attempt to stop you from giving evidence. I know, and it's backfired. I'm done with doing victim. Good. It's a good thing the store for didn't see the <laughs> short amount of time, you're going to be in a police cell. And I hope you rot there. Oh, he hung up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's supposed to be a new phone with all this security software. How did they hack it? Well, um, you probably made that call from a payphone. <clears throat> we'll put a trace on it and try and find out where they phoned from. You've gone straight to the root of the problem, my dear, and a very rotten root it is too. The only other person that knows that number, apart from our parents, is Detective Inspector Jones, isn't it, Mrs. Drummond? Exactly, Ed. That could be the news I'm waiting for. If it was Inspector Jones, that's quite serious, isn't it? Well, it won't be just a gang going on trial, that's for sure. But why would he do such an awful thing? He's police. Money? I guess. Unless this Forgione bloke has something on him. Something on him? You know, blackmail. Perhaps because they worked together before. They've got the stalker. Brilliant. And, as I'd hoped, it didn't take very much questioning to get the name of his accomplice. You mean he grasped up D.I. Jones? Colloquially speaking, Ed, yes. But will one person's testimony be enough? Jones could just say he was making it up out of malice. Goodness, Ed. I hope you're thinking of a career as a detective. <laughs> you're right, though. We'll need more than that. And where do you think we can get it? There's the rest of the gang. They're all in prison. And the top dog, Forgione. So, what kind of incentive could be offered, do you think, in return for their cooperation? <laughs> well, if they were to cooperate, I guess it would be taken into account with their sentencing. Exactly. <laughs> now, I've also heard that D.I. Jones is on his way here. He should be with us in a couple of hours. Perhaps he's bringing me a nice new phone. Perhaps he is. But before he gets here, I need to have a word with the boys about the CCTV here. Are you sure you wanted to move your rook there? Positive. I've got a plan. Did you plan my bishop doing this? Uh, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> Take your time. Very big of you. Because you're king. He's very vulnerable. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> that was the boys. They tell me the CCTV in here is up and running nicely. Oh, and they said your king is very vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> so does that mean that they're watching and listening to everything that happens in here? Everything we say and do in here is being filmed and recorded in the smallest detail. Oh. <laughs> ah, that sounds like D.I. Jones now. Right on the side.
This new procedure. Since our latest visitor to keep the door locked at all times? Yes, Inspector. I hear he's being apprehended. Didn't take them long. Is he talking? Singing like a nightingale, Inspector. Mm -hmm. So I take it he's confessed to being a stalker? Oh, he's confessed to a great deal more than that. <laughs> what do you mean? I think you know exactly what I mean. Come on, Annie. All this mystery doesn't cut it with me. What's he been saying? Oh, he's been saying who gave him Sam's mobile number, who told him where the safe house was, oh, and who is being well paid for all this information, Inspector? A deadbeat like him makes it up as he goes along. A deadbeat like him? has been fully and independently corroborated by the rest of the gang, Inspector. Checkmate! I couldn't have put it better myself, Sam. <laughs> I wouldn't bother, Inspector. They'll pick you up even more quickly <coughs> than the deadbeat. <laughs> Enrico Forgioni and his five gang members, each 
each received life sentences for triple murder, attempted murder, and importing more than £500 million worth of cocaine into the UK. Judge James Cable praised the 16-year-old key witness for her courage in testifying, despite repeated attempts at intimidation by the gang. Quite a few years since Playwright Players gave you a full length thriller, and also we've done quite a new few things for the very first time, so we'd like to have your views. So please stay around. Please welcome back into the auditorium the cast and writer and director, Jane Ryan. Playwright players are well known for their comedy, so I'm going to ask my first question out to the uh, writer and director Jane Ryan. Why thriller? About time, I think we all thought, didn't we? We all wanted to get our teeth into something serious. We last did a thriller about three years ago. In fact, it was the last time we did a spring production three years ago too. So we thought it was about time to relaunch Playwright players as people who can do serious drama and uh, frighten people in the audience on our souls occasionally as well. <laughs> okay. So, as we've all noticed, uh, and in the, in the announcement that you are also from the director as well as a writer, why did you decide to write it yourself? Well, I was up for directing, and I really wanted to showcase our young talent. We're lucky in Perryway, we know we are. We get young people coming up through the pantomimes, and joining us for more serious drama. Our live wire group is our youth arm of Perrier players. We know we're unusual. There are 90 amateur dramatic groups in Gloucestershire. I've been told by Gloucestershire Arts Council that we're one of the very few that really bring on young actors. And we feel that it's a great privilege to have these amazing young people as part of Perrier players. So I wanted to showcase their skills. Well, I looked around for a thriller couldn't find one, so I thought, well, I'd better write it myself in that case. <laughs> what led you to this subject? The subject had to be gripping, and I think when you see displays of young people being extremely brave, um, I've seen that in my background working in secondary schools. I, I've seen examples of extraordinary courage in teenagers, which have blown me away, quite frankly, and I just felt I wanted to show how extraordinary young people can be. So it had to be a thriller. And it was a good medium as well because I used to write scripts for training films. So I'm more of a film person than anything else. So that took us to the point of departure of the Gores, which was another thing entirely as well. Looking around at the cast, um, we see, as you said, youth is one of the, um, the, 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 the massive points of the uh, show. Um, <laughs> Yes, Henry. Um, <laughs> now, the audience tonight have been you know, um, had the pleasure of seeing one cast, and last night there was another cast. So I'm going to ask this question out to, to all of you. What are the pros and cons of part sharing? And let's start with the kids first. When we're rehearsing, you can see the other people performing and take um, just watch them and think, well, I quite like that bit, or don't think that was quite so well, and you can sort of help each other out, because you're both doing the same role, you have sort of um, more knowledge of what's going on, um, so you can sort of help each other more, and you always, an under, you, you always have an understudy, which is um, something which I find quite, um, uh, help me to relax a bit more, so there's always someone to, if you knew that if this, the, bad, the worst did happen, the show could go on, if that makes sense. 
It really helps uh, learn your lines uh, to see someone else do it. Okay. Um, uh, isn't that the Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> it does bring a different dynamic, I think, when you're working with different brother and sister. Um, so each part, they bring something different to it. And each night is different. So I think you're right, you learn from them, they learn from you. And also the interaction between them is different. So yeah, it's interesting. <coughs> What about the stalker? You've had to stalk two sets of uh, brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be in a small cast. <laughs> the whole set's here, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, on that note of pros and cons of part sharing, um, we, we can notice that there are very few parts because we're looking at the cast now. Um, I will pass this question to the uh, older members of the cast. Um, does this make it very demanding um, for the players? Yeah, there's certainly nowhere to hide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I certainly feel very focused on you. Um, I enjoy panto, you can kind of disappear. <laughs> no, I, I do. I like to be on front stage. Um, but yeah, I think, I certainly in, my, in scenes where I'm, I'm literally on stage on my own, that's, uh, yeah, that's new for me. And uh, no, just bring out different parts of my uh, repertoire. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in here anytime? time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just talk about the older ones and who didn't apply to us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it is, it is really interesting having a small cast because you are really in the spotlight. There's nowhere to hide. You know, you're there and you know each other's strengths, each other's weaknesses. And like you said, there's a heck of a lot of room backstage in the green room. There's nobody else there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll we'll move on to the next point. Um, Jen, you've highlighted it already. Um, we saw you use the gauze for, well, we saw Periway players use the gauze for the first time this year in the pantomime in Beauty and the Beast. But what were your reasons for using it here in the safe house? How long have you got? <laughs> it just lit me up. Um, so I've never written for stage drama before. It was, I, I used to write scripts for training films. So I've always thought and seen things filmically. And when I saw that gauze, it just kind of let off a fuse in my brain. It was just like, my goodness, what we can do with that. And of course, we've seen tonight what you can do with it. You can, you can transport people, you can fill the hall with the northern lights. You know, you can show shots of, of the most beautiful scenery. I love the Highlands. What's not to like about being able to do stuff like that? The Starry Starry Night I particularly love because, again, you can have massively quick scene changes. And that was actual live footage um, from Shutterstock. Thank you, Shutterstock. Uh, yeah, you do, we do pay for this stuff and pay for the license. But it had twinkling stars. It had to be live. It, 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 didn't, it mustn't have been a still. So stuff like that became incredibly important to make it so real. And I think, again, it, coming back to the fact that it was a thriller, it had to feel like this could be happening in front of me. And that, that kind of thing helped to bring this, this kind of real reality to it, I think, which is so important. How about the cast members? Was it difficult or how, how has it been having another dimension to worry about? It, it brings the whole thing to life. It, it, it gives a sort of... A, makes a static scene very uh, mobile, doesn't it? And yeah, it's, it's good. Um, but yeah, it's another tool. Um. I think it was also when, when we started to get the effects, because I've been seeing all these things in my head during rehearsals, and then when you guys had a chance to see the stuff projected, it was quite exciting, wasn't it? When, and it does yeah. bring together, it really brings together both cinema and theatre. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes you're not quite sure what's, whether you're in a film or whether you're on stage. It does bring the, the two together, doesn't it? Yeah, for me, it was, you've got the best of live theatre uh, because it's amplified by the gauze. And the gauze gives us actually the cinematographic feeling to it. But also, it's actually far harder than cinema or TV because you've only got one take and it's tonight, you know, it's got to be right. So... In some ways, it's incredibly challenging too, but I think it was part of the excitement in a way, wasn't it? I hope you thought so. <laughs> yeah. 
So you, you just uh, used a challenge. My next question is, what were the technical challenges of using gauzes? Uh, well, I've got a team back there that advised me, and you can all stand up and have a round of applause. Young Windsor Cooper joined us just this year to do his Duke of Edinburgh Bronze and was asked by me to take on the role of projectionist and lighting assistant in a play that was quite stuffed with special effects. So thank you, Windsor, and I hope you're going to be with us for the pantomime and the next thriller and many years beyond. He, he's chained to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, without these guys, the magicians wouldn't have happened. So you've probably answered this next question. Will you be using the gauze again? Yeah. <laughs> I've written the thriller, the next thriller, and I'm thinking about a third one at the moment. It's, it's a kind of trilogy, and the gauze is going to play a key part massively, and I think there are other things we can explore with it. For example, we've already had a touch of... You saw when you came in, you, you've got the scenery lit behind, and you've got the stuff on the gauze itself. I want to take it a step beyond that um, and have, for example, so you can see the interior of a shop, the gauze is the shop front, and you're lighting people on the stage in front of the shop. So maybe there's a burglar in a shop and there are people going past, something like that. So the, the, the possibilities with this gauze are just extraordinary. Very exciting. Yeah. Wow. So in answer, to the next, <laughs> in answer to the next question, have you got plans for the 2019 spring production, Jane? It sounds like you already have. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of shaping up with another brother and sister duo at the heart of it. Very much family themes again. Um, the emphasis this time is very much on the, the father. I'm not going to plot spoil too much, but um, very exciting. Where we're planning to use also branch out a bit with sound, surround sound, so I want to create some really interesting effects. For example, a manhunt across Dartmoor with helicopters overhead to searchlights and, and say a dirt bike that starts at the end of the hall and roars. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? We really like to see um, Reese has just passed down and I'm feeling very faint. <laughs> and our health and safety officer <laughs> and now has a glass of wine in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Windows has left. <laughs> um, okay, at this point, I would like to um, turn the questions to the floor. Are there any of the audience members would like to uh, ask any questions to our, our cast? Daisy and Taylor, you... Sorry to put them on the spot. It's your brother and sister, and you're playing brother and sister. How can you talk about what your experience has been like playing siblings as siblings? <laughs> It is method acting in its purest. <laughs> Dad is going yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stalker, would you agree? <laughs> It's really good for learning your lines, especially because we live in the same house. So, um, <laughs> you have to wait for the next rehearsal to actually do it with the character you're acting for most of the scenes with. So, um, no, I think it's been really useful and it's been quite nice to do something um, to do a play with Daisy again. Um, we'll go front first, please. Um, how is it going from? Uh, from, a, a, from acting in pantomime to acting in a thriller, because uh, if, if, is, is it, um, are there skills that cross over from one into the other, or is it a completely different skill set that you're, you're using here as you would do in a pantomime? Uh, well, I was a cross-dressing um, <laughs> <laughs> sister in the last production. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah, I've been, I've been a lot of it through in this, as you can see. Um, yeah, no, I think the, the, the nice thing about this is it is so different and it's, it's, a it's completely exactly different kind of acting, isn't it? Yeah, it's that's true. Exactly straight. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's, there's no difference really, only my book. In order to sell the comedy. The only thing is, obviously with this, like, 
even if you're acting a straight scene in a comedy, if it goes wrong, yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? it not, not it doesn't matter, but it, it, you can put it rain, you can add lib, or whatever you can do to put it back on track. But obviously in this, you, you haven't got that room for manoeuvre, you have to sort of get it right. Because tension is the thing that needs, yeah. you need to work as a scene. Julie, would you like to answer because you were fairy in Beauty and the Beast? Yes, obviously, similarities there again. Beating um, <laughs> that large man, yeah? <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, acting is acting, so some of the skills that you do in the pantomime you transfer to a thriller, but they are two very different beasts, and you, you can't play a thriller for laughs. You know, it, the, the tension is, is so important, and, you know, the pantomime, as you say, if you go wrong, you can add lib, you can cover it up. And sometimes going wrong is actually funny and people laugh even more because it's unintentional. Do that in a thriller, I think you've ruined it. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just to sort of wrap up um, the evening, um, we just want to make one final um, announcement and that was that um, we are very local and it's very um, a good point to pull out that um, you might have seen coming into the auditorium two buckets at the front um, they, I, this is a charity plea but I just want to explain behind the reasons for it we are members of FCA which is Frampton Community Association um, and that is the organisation that it represents everything in the village from sailing clubs to silver bands and um, we're very proud members of it this year the FCA have adopted a charity which is the Grand Appeal it's a children's hospital in Bristol. Uh, at the beginning of the year, Beauty and the Beast, we um, donated um, um, some buckets and some, um, some money for the show. And we've decided that for the rest of the year, we are going to take up with SCA the Grand Appeal. So I would ask on your way out, you'll see um, some charity buckets. Please give sparingly. Any, any change um, will make a difference. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for coming this evening. One more round of applause for the cast of The Safe House.